Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what a beautiful Tuesday it is on this fine September 26, 2017. Let's celebrate by learning some StarCraft, shall we? I'm in an excellent mood, just had myself a nice relaxing session of Hearthstone, and now we get to... S <coughs> we get to choke on our very own glass of coffee. We get to step into the Terran vs. Terran matchup today. We're going to be looking at Flash vs. Fantasy from the Teeving OSL semifinals. This was the last on GameNet Star League before they shifted over fully to StarCraft II. And at this era, Flash was still considered like the best Terran of all time, but Fantasy was kind of considered the best present tense Terran player. And if you watched some of the previous Let's Learn StarCraft videos, you may have seen the Fantasy vs. Stork OSL finals, where, actually I won't spoil the results, but Fantasy plays a really interesting, aggressive style of TVP, a very attacking, micro-focused style. And Flash, you've also heard me talk about, is traditionally a big, sturdy, forceful, very deliberate, gradual, careful player. And I like to say that Fantasy is embodied by the Vulture, and Flash is embodied by the tank. Those really highlight their play styles. Now, since this is still relatively early in the Let's Learn StarCraft series, all I really want you to focus on as we're watching this is the idea of positional play. Terran vs. Terran is one of the most beautiful matchups to watch because it's not variant in terms of what units get built. There's a little bit of switching here and there, but primarily it's tanks, goliaths, dropships, and to a lesser extent, vultures and wraiths. And that's it. It's just kind of really those three units, even really two tanks and goliaths. And it's all about how these players are going to be taking positions, holding positions, seizing positions, identifying weak points in positions. It's much less about the specifics of the opening build order. We're certainly going to be talking about that, but in the words of Artosis, in Terran vs. Terran, in terms of the opening, anything can work. You just have to know where your strengths and weaknesses lie. So with that, let's head into our very first game. This is on uh, the map Neo... Ground Zero, I think is the name of it. As always, I know how all the maps look and how none of the maps get named. So in this map, we're going to first take a big look at the entire map. Many times when I do these sorts of map analyses, I just kind of talk about the main and the natural and maybe a third base, and if it's a short game, I'm like, oh, well, whatever, no big deal. We can sort of ignore everything else because the game isn't really going to take place there. But in Terran vs. Terran, very often, this blue player who's up in the top left, who's Flash, and this player down in bottom left who's in white, you can barely see him down there, That's, this is Fantasy from SK Telecom. It's very common for Fantasy to have this entire side of the map. It's very common for Flash to have this entire side of the map. And with a statement just like that, notice how you can immediately state, wow, then these side expansions are important. If you look at the mini-map, there's three expansions per main base. The main, the natural, and then the mineral-only natural that's up here in the top corner. And beyond that, it's really just these side bases. And this is very much so how Terran vs. Terran should be thought about. It's not merely about how to get from your second to your third, and maybe some cute way to get a fourth. In fact, it's how you're going to divvy up the entire map. The reason this is true is that siege tanks are so efficient at destroying everything else that you plant five or so siege tanks in an area, and it's safe. Yeah, your opponent can build more units and break through, but the units he's going to be building and breaking through with are tanks. So. There's not really cost-effective ways to break positions in a short-term local sense. The cost-effectiveness of breaking those positions has to be a big, long-term, map-wide consideration. You have five siege tanks there. I will run up and I will lose ten siege tanks, but I've now denied you a fifth, sixth, and seventh base. And if I just make this go on long enough, you'll run out of money. Very interesting to watch. So let's keep this in mind. And when we're looking at this map, we have Flash up here in the top left corner. The main base is just a nice sized, normal looking main base up in a corner. A little bit of access from air on this side. A ramp 
and a natural expansion. This entrance is, is pretty wide compared to other ones, but you know, it's still a very manageable entrance size. Uh, in many modern maps, access to third gases are relatively easy, but in this map, this is your third expansion, this mineral only expansion up here. And this will lead to some weirdness in this game. For instance, imagine if Flash were here and Fantasy were instead up here in this top right area. Now all of a sudden, Flash could say to himself, all right, this is my first base, this is my second base. Excuse me, this is my second base, this is my third base. And now I'm gonna get an easy third gas. But as we see, Fantasy is in the way and will uh, sort of make this problematic to guarantee this. Other things to note about the center area, it's not actually an open center. It is a circular center. It has big wide open spaces, but there's this side and there's this side. And this might seem like, well, you know, isn't it just still pretty close? It's pretty significant to have to take some army, run it down this way, and then move it back up to this side to defend. Beyond that, there's kind of these interesting little choke points that in, in many matchups, this would not be considered a very wide choke point. Like if I'm Zerg and I'm burrowing a whole bunch of lurkers here to defend, Protoss can hit me from two wide angles. But in Terran versus Terran, just putting some siege tanks here effectively shuts it down. All right. Talk plenty about the map analysis. Let's look at the opening with... You're going to kill me. I We, we got to say one more thing. Note... A very important concept and strategy that was brought up in the introduction to strategy. This was brought up in the introduction to strategy episode of this series. In StarCraft, you want to think about what is happening in the mid and late game, so you'll always have a destination of where you're going to. It's not here's my step one. What's he doing? Hmm. I guess I'll do this as step two. And what now? Hmm. I guess I'll do this as step three. You're trying to get to location X every single game. For instance, in this matchup, you're trying to get to two factories making tanks, two factories making Goliaths, and trying to think about how to secure all the expansions on the map. That's your big long-term plan. So we're going to be asking ourselves the question in this opening, how do the openings flow into that? People like to think that the, the way StarCraft works is that you begin in one common place, workers and a supply, or excuse me, workers and a command center, and that it just keeps growing in variability from there, when really in StarCraft, things tend to converge in the mid-game and late-game. Just in terms of the look of what structures are there and the goals, there's tons of variability in where units are, what they're doing, how many have stayed alive, how many have died, and so on. But there's still a convergence in the look of things. Both of these players have a few things to worry about in Terran vs. Terran in the early game. One of them would be whole bunch of vultures swinging on in and killing your SCVs. One would be cloaked wraiths coming in and picking away at these SCVs a little bit at a time. Another would be a slightly rare but still ever possible tank vulture push at the start of the game. But for the most part, I think you'll note that vultures get shut down by tanks. Wraiths get shut down relatively easily by a combination of missile turrets and a small number of goliaths. And therefore, in the opening game, you're really just trying to do small adjustments, small fixes to deny ultra-fast vultures or ultra-fast wraiths. And if you can deny those things, you're just going to get your tank and you're going to be fine. So both players do an extremely similar... Um, style of opening. Flash goes for command center first, into barracks. As you can see, let me just once again re-remind, Flash is his player up in the top left, and is immediately going for gas afterwards. Nothing out of the ordinary here. We see that Fantasy is going for a barracks first, and then command center, and then we'll be building his gas geyser shortly. In, in a very technical sense, yeah, Flash has a light advantage because he has his command center first, but it's, it's, it's not overwhelming. They're both just going for fast command center. And just right now, you might say, well, wh why is it okay to fast expand in Terran versus Terran? Well, again, note, all you need to defend against is really fast wraiths, which you need, like, just a Goliath or two to do. Um, 
really fast vultures, and you just need some good wall-offs with building and a tank or two, and you're safe. So getting an expansion quite quickly is pretty common in the matchup. There's lots of ways to do it, and there's lots of easy ways to lose if you're not flash or fantasy, so if you don't want to take an ultra-fast expansion, it's totally fine in your games, but the reason it's mostly safe is you just get the tank up and you're pretty safe, you get some anti-air up and you're pretty safe. So, Flash Flash plays a little bit more the way that I like to play, which is very deliberate and safe and conservative, but trying to cut corners where he can, right? Like, okay, I'm going to go command center first. That's a little corner cut, but then I'm not messing around, man. I am going straight for a barracks at the front, a bunker, and eventually another building here, if need be, to block vultures. Fantasy as a player, I, I would absolutely be horrible if I tried to mimic his styles. He does lots of little annoying things like this, applies pressure with Marines, has a second Marine here, and is going to lift off this Barracks to scout. It's a different kind of way to cut a corner. And Barracks scouting is ridiculously common in this matchup. Flash kind of wants to keep this here until he can see exactly what his opponent's doing. And this is, this is honestly... I would say it's sloppy from fantasy, but I mean this this happens frequently enough that this is this is kind of like a skill play. It's like getting shot in Counter Strike. You wouldn't go to the guy who got shot and be like, "Oh, he got shot." That's sloppy. People get shot all the time in that game. That's kind of like how it works. Workers are going to get into bases, so this is just unfortunate for fantasy. And in theory, he could have been able to block this with the Marines, but now Flash is going to be like, "Oh, okay." Is going to be more comfortable lifting this sooner than he would have. What do we see in the bases? Pretty basic stuff. Getting up factories for tanks and things. I'll just make a few brief notes. Oh, by the way, armory for Goliaths, academy for scan, no problem. And what do we see? Ooh, a starport coming out of flash. As well as an academy for scan. Great. Some of the things that I'd like to talk about have to do with unit composition, and it, it's pretty easy to understand, but the tactics of it wind up being completely weird and insane. Marines die to everything. These guys, these puppies suck, man. <laughs> Vultures too shot them. Goliaths have great range against them and can pick them off. Tanks obliterate Marines. So you don't build anything out of that. What about out of the starport? Well, out of the starport, wraiths, very flimsy. Battle cruisers, great unit, super expensive. Nothing else out of this really does any significant anti-ground uh, anti damage. Um, but in the factory units, tanks are amazing against vultures. They're amazing against goliaths. And they're amazing against other tanks. Vultures are not good against any factory unit, except... You can plant a whole bunch of mines, which can slow down the enemy and can help you control positions. And if you're spending all of your gas on building tanks, it's actually very nice to have maybe a few extra vultures to help soak some tank shots. So vultures have this weird identity where they're not even used for their attack. They're used for their speedy, you know, meat shieldy qualities as well as mines. So again, this unit is about the tank. In many ways, Terran is about the tank. I also think that my scroll speed is... Nope, it is at slowest. Damn. So we have wraiths getting produced. Now, what are these wraiths about for Flash? A wraith is an interesting unit to be uh, incorporated into your gameplay in the early game. It's very good at picking off dropships, trying to do annoying things. It's very good at guaranteed killing this barracks, or at the very least forcing it way, way, way far back. Sometimes it's a way to just cutely force your opponent to get a little bit more anti-air than he normally would. And super importantly, perhaps most importantly of all, early game wraiths can provide visions for your tanks. Tanks shoot farther than they see, and so in all Terran versus Terran, I should say in all Terran matchups, you're trying to find a way 
to maximize the tank range at all times. You're trying to find a way to get a spotter. If you're against Zerg, you'll use science vessels. If you're against Protoss, you'll dart forward with vultures. But when it's tank versus tank, having a wraith can be very helpful in terms of just giving your tanks a little bit of an edge against his tanks. <laughs> the unsung hero of this matchup is the commsat station, man. Spotting tanks, spotting what everything's doing. Ooh, ooh, so many scans go off in this matchup. A lot of Terran players will have every single scan that they have built in the game. Like six scans, all hotkey, just to constantly blast them out. Now, Fantasy is doing the super duper standard look. These two factories make tanks. These two factories make Goliaths. Now, why, why Goliaths? You just heard me talk about how Goliaths are not good against tanks. Well, the Goliaths are good at killing wraiths, which are certainly annoying. But more importantly, they are unbelievable at killing dropships. If dropships try to come in and unload on top of your siege tanks, your Goliaths can shoot them down. So Flash starts off... He's built a reasonable number of tanks. He's got five or so. This should make him feel mostly comfortable. He just lost his barracks and saw that Fantasy doesn't really have as many tanks. There's this little wraith that got repelled by Senior Goliath. And Flash is doing something that is already starting on the pace that we hinted at earlier. Flash is taking expansions right away, taking positions right away. Does he even have Siege Mode done? There it is, it just finished. There's our good friend the Wraith, just trying to get a little bit of vision. And if you're Fantasy, this is just uncomfortable. This is the power of the Wraith. You don't know if these siege tanks are advancing forward. You don't know if they're just sitting there. Oh my gosh. I realize I forgot to switch my game on Twitch to StarCraft. I knew. I knew I was forgetting something. Yeah, there it is. Update information. Ah. Ah. Excellent. 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 Updated. Perfect. So Flash is going to use this position that he has, use a little bit of the extra vision advantage that he has from this Wraith. Oh, by the way, people who play this game a lot love to use terms like vision advantage. I mean, this is just like he can see more stuff, dude. <laughs> Most vision advantages are not actually like very complex to think about and to understand. So the barracks died, so we must rebuild that in order to build additional factories. Meanwhile, in Fantasy's base, he's just building out usual set of supply depots, academy armory already done, not even teching up to a starport, just trying to slowly advance his way forward in order to set up some positions. So here's where things become a little interesting in this game. Fantasy is getting some vultures for mines to help support these tanks, and also because vultures, as we said before, are good at absorbing tank shots. Look at Flash's setup. A literal line of tanks, a literal line of tanks. Imagine for a moment if these four tanks were placed slightly farther back. What you can do as Fantasy is walk literally one square inside of his tank range with three tanks. This shoots once, you siege up, you shoot once back, and you kill a tank for free. So, perfect lines of tanks are very, very common. And although Flash got this expansion up earlier, this is not a super desirable expansion. Fantasy is the one who, with this position, is able to begin building the super desirable left expansion. Fantasy is only just now starting a starport. He doesn't really have that much mobility. This is part of the reason why he's just sieging up the tanks and letting them sit there, man. He can't afford to try to be cute. If you were trying to run out and do stuff with these tanks, if he lost a few, he'd be in terrible position. So, all right, Fantasy just says, okay, well, 
Looks like you are all the way locked in. You can hear the scans going off. You're going to hear them go off all game long. And Flash does something really interesting. Something that is really fascinating when you consider Tank Goliath and the mixture in this matchup. I'm Flash. I know that in Terran vs. Terran, the bulk of everything that's good in this game comes from the tank. It's all about tanks dealing damage and holding positions. So I want to spend as much of my gas as possible doing that. Well, if I have all this extra minerals that I can't turn into tanks, man, I'm just going to make a ton of vultures to help me do anything to support these tanks. Notice how weird that is. Pretty much all the time in like a game like StarCraft 2, you want to be building units that are good in some way, that sort of counter one of his things. The vultures are literally... We're like the least bad thing you could do with minerals. Cool. So let's see the way that Flash makes use of that. All right. So there's some cute things that Flash does. I love this move. This is like a really common um, kind of rounding out the early game move. This is still, I would consider, like early game Terran vs. Terran. This is just now broaching into mid game. Mid game is really all about getting third, fourth, fifth gases, third, fourth, fifth bases with gas. But I love this. This is this shows the calm that Flash is known for. He is sending this drop ship all the hell the way around the entire map, man. He is not trying to do. Oh wait, I can. I can. Can I follow this like super strictly? Uh, maybe not. Is it alt click, control click, shift click? I don't know. But super calm goes all the way around the entire map to maximize, and at the same time sends another drop up to this expansion as well. Just, you know, yeah, I might lose them, but I might lose some minerals in order to cost him some gas. And now while he's distracted, I'm going to try to move out and do something good. See the mines? They're not that great. They can do a, like light zoning. And now Flash moves around this side. I am going to be zoomed back a ton in this game because it's very significant and very important. Nice little play. See how that drop linked up with this move out? Flash does the drop, moves out, and tries to threaten as scary a possible angle for fantasy as possible. He once upon a time had a tank line here, and now he has, again, almost a literal line of tanks right here. This main base, barely defended in time by fantasy. Now, if I'm Flash, I'm like, well, what about in my main entrance area? Well, actually, that's okay, because as long as these vultures plant a ton of mines here and siege up in order to defend, look at the vision that Flash has and in terms of the control that he has. He moved out scarily. He left a bunch. He's pulling back, and now he's just going to siege up here. See how scan is, like, so damn important? Oh, well, he sees him. Oh, okay, I can maybe move forward a little bit more. Vulture's absorbing these shots. Flash very carefully trying to target fire his siege tanks against their siege tanks. But, of course, can't be everywhere all at once. So some of these shots don't quite go his way. So if I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, man, this is... This is a good position for Flash, because look at this now. Look at this. Flash can now take this command center. Flash can now take this command center. Fantasy is going to be as annoying as he can with these vultures. Remember, vultures are really not good against tanks. They're really not good against much of anything except enemy vultures and enemy workers. So this is like a very nice, elegant move that Flash used to get into this good position. But I want to note something that's really important. This is very deceptive. 126 supply for Fantasy, 144 supply for Fanta er, for Flash. But Fantasy has had this gas expansion. The tank count for Fantasy is actually getting quite high. He has quite a lot of tanks. He has also already gotten plus one attack on his tanks. Flash hasn't. 
Plus two is really important because then this does 80 damage. So two of them deal 160, which is enough to two shot an enemy tank, which is down from three shotting. Unbelievably important upgrade. So Flash is playing a little bit from behind. He has to do this very nice series of moves to secure a lot of space in order to be able to get these other expansions. And Flash literally just instant double expos, man. You know, given that he's super holed up, Fantasy's doing what he can. Has the defensive line set up, just taking the mineral only. And look at just the incredible calm and patience that Flash does this way. Just sending all the way along the far corner side of the map. Oh my gosh, so sick. So this phase of the game, now that we're around 12 minutes, this phase of the game is marked by massive dropship production. You're gonna need a lot of dropships in order to move around your big ol' army. You can delay this. You can delay this doing some fancy moves like what you're doing with Flash, but you'll never be able to get truly aggressive until you have dropships. Dropships allow you to pierce through any weak point. If this were still five tanks as the game goes on, Fantasy loads up a whole bunch of tanks and Goliaths, unloads them, these each get one shot off, and then they're all dead. Fantasy, though, is just still trying to be annoying with vultures. The minimap can be a little deceptive, because look at it. There's like blue and white everywhere, man. It's just like, it's like a lot of mines. It's a lot of mines. It's a lot of mines. It's not, it's not all units everywhere. Flash is still doing just these really cute tactical things. And you have to just be impressed with the level of judgment that each player is able to use. If Fantasy didn't have these units available, this army would be able to walk down there completely unimpeded. See this guy out here? He's a little farther forward. So now Fantasy will be able to shoot this one down. Free tank. Overall, very, very nice defense. Oh, that's Kakaru. That's what this thing is called. Do you guys know the Kakaru? Yeah. The original tasteless bot. So here's a significant moment. Big scans come up here from Fantasy. This is all he's doing. There comes a point where if your Terran opponent is saying, you know what, I expanded later than you did, but I'm defended here, and I'm defended here, and you know what? I'm attacking down here. Part of you just calls bullshit, man. This is exactly what Fantasy does. He's like, yeah, my ass, you can do all that stuff. He just waltzes right up and breaks. Now take a moment to just look at this enormous flip. Your flash, there's literally a huge slice right down the middle between all of your forces and three of your important bases. This is what this matchup is all about, is being able to identify weakness, being able to pounce on that. Fantasy's playing this really, really calmly. He's just gonna try to waltz forward, make as much of progress as he can here. Vultures are gonna try to help, but it's one tank, man. It's like, not a lot. This is where if you're Flash, you're like, do I unsiege all these? Do I unsiege all these? Uh. Have to be a very careful judge. Because, I mean, if you're Fantasy and you scan this right now, you're like, oh, one tank. Oh, it's one single tank. All the SCVs from Flash were transferring to the top right expansion. Well, this is such a sick play from Fantasy. He just kept building up a big muscular force and then just saw weakness in one place and busted through. And now... Hey, I have the upper hand. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand. I'm gonna expand down here. So this is a little risky because he doesn't exactly control this space. You know, there, there still is, there still is a lot of blue on the map on this side. Oh god. This is the advantage that uh, Fantasy provided for himself by going for these much slower stronger armies, this this very tank-focused plus Goliaths-focused army. Both players are still building vultures because they have these mineral-only expansions. And they're just hurling vultures at each other. And slowly over time, the tank count is just... 
I, I'm pretty sure that this advantage goes to Fantasy at this point. Flash does not really seem to have that many tanks. He has a few tanks here. There's one there. It's like two here. And there's like maybe ten. So in the meantime, you see some weird things going on. Expansion from Flash. Expansion from Flash. Why? They're not safe. They're totally not safe. It's coming down to one really simple thing. There's a ton of extra minerals because you have mineral-only expansion. Same reason why these players are building vultures, which are not good units to build in this spot. Just, just got a lot of money, man. That's it. No big deal. No intense complexity here. Identifying which expansions are safe and where the weak points are. That's the hard part. I gotta back up just 15 seconds. It'll rebuild the game real fast. Boom. Um, so this is on the verge of becoming safe eventually. This is unsafe. This is on the verge of becoming safe thanks to having all this space under lockdown. One of the big things that you're always looking for when trying to identify weakness is if you can attack on the point. Like right here. This is the point of this tank line. Like attacking here is obviously the worst because all the various ranges of these tanks are right here. But if you can attack like here or here, that's where there's going to be a lot of weakness. And so Flash, in the midst of all this defense, finally says, hey, here's a good opportunity. Finds this point, and just does a really basic thing, just picks off a few of these tanks and sieges up a few of his own. It's like straight trench warfare, man. The thing that was most amazing to me about this game is how long it took for players to start building dropships. Like, Flash just now has two, and he's built a second starport, so he can begin flooding more. And Fantasy, I think, is still not building dropships, which is insane. I mean, that is a core unit. That's like, yeah, I'm going to play Terran vs. Zerg with Marines, but I'm just not building medics this game. Like, it's weird. Fantasy answers by trying to just rebust through the exact same place. Slews more vultures just making their way in. And this is really interesting the way that Fantasy is doing this because he's moving vultures up to here and forces up to here and then looping them around what he perceives to be a dangerous position here. Yeah, and even though there's tanks here, Fantasy really is chipping in pretty hard. There is just not that much stuff that Flash can do here, but finally we see the glorious benefits of dropships in this matchup. Yes! This doesn't really matter that much. These tanks up on the high ground again, securing this front base. Whew, so there's been quite a lot of action in the last few minutes, right? Remember when I said, hey, it's starting to be about mid-game. It's been like six minutes since that point in time. So Flash is really just trying to secure this side of the map, just so he can get two extra gas geysers worth of stuff. Bringing him to a total of four. And with all this excessive expanding from Flash, Flash is suddenly threatening Fantasy in a pretty big way. Fantasy appears to be doing a lot of damage up here, but Flash is really stabilized. And now Fantasy doesn't have geyser four. He doesn't have geyser five. Flash if he just gets this base functioning or this base functioning, he's at five gas. Which means he can have a massive amount of tanks being produced, of dropships being produced. So if you're Fantasy, you're starting to be like, oh shit, I really gotta put the pressure on. So let's see how Fantasy does this. Just a few minutes ago, Fantasy was very much so cloistered up in his base. We saw this tank line, and then this tank line pretty much being the farthest out that Fantasy could be. And this is the really dicey moment. Advance forward. Try to use the Science Vessel to get his tanks to auto-target onto your tanks. And through just very smart target firing of which tank on which tank, Fantasy is able to clear through some of the defenses, but Flash is still ferrying over more. If we step to the big picture for a moment, Flash has got to be careful not to leave too little defenses here. Flash also, remember these tanks that were over here earlier on? 
He just walked him right back over here. And look at this. Flash is now taking this bottom right thing. <laughs> is this not insane? Is this remarkable? This is remarkable. So if you're fantasy, you're just like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. You seemed like you were doing great, and suddenly Flash has three mains. So this is this is a play, this is a very painful play to make if you're fantasy. If you're fantasy, you just kind of want to not ever have to worry about your opponent expanding or securing this position. So you just, you kind of got to just go back and do it. And in the meantime, if you're Flash, you're like, oh... Oh, what weaknesses do we have here? Oh, look at this. I'm gonna leave some tanks here just to defend this area. I can't express to you how stupid and annoying this feels. If you are... Uh, if you are fantasy. And remember this little troop of units here? Moving down, picking some stuff off. Oh, remember these drop ships? Yeah, Flash is just going to use them to continue to be annoying. But this was a huge moment in the game. While all this was going on, really this looks like the most normal Terran mid-game finally. With a lot of dropships containing Goliaths and tanks. A lot of tanks and Goliaths and lines all over the map. There's this really weird late game, mid and late game if you have enough gas. And on three gas geysers this feels very stressful. This is very difficult to make move if you're fantasy. In sort of mid and late game, you can just suddenly begin building a lot of wraiths. One thing to note, you get the comfort of being able to do this a little bit freely. So many scans are used in the middle of the map. The thing that's weird about wraiths is that we already talked about the fact that all wraiths die super easily to everything. They all die so easily to everything all the time. Why on earth would you just suddenly start building a lot of wraiths? Because they are amazing at killing dropships. And they are amazing at exploiting any single weak point quickly. If there's some tanks that don't have goliaths, you just kill. Right here. Boom. Boom. That is the biggest moment in the game as far as I'm concerned. Right now, dropship production doesn't exist. Where are the dropships? Well, there's two. These units up in the top right are now cut off. These units down in the bottom right are now cut off. Really clever. I'd like to emphasize once again to any of you who play Terran, Fantasy like has not built dropships this game. That's insane. And Flash is like, alright, screw this. You know what? If you got wraiths, man, I'm just going to build nothing but turrets. <laughs> just starts surrounding himself. So th this is still... Flash with one, two, three bases on the right. His three bases here are mined out. Main base, basically mined out for fantasy. Natural mined out for fantasy. This third is getting close to mined out. Fantasy is in a severe bind. See the wraiths moving around? Trying to look for any weakness. Hey! Hey, maybe I can just kill these dropships. Yeah, I can. Look at that. Great. Keeping everything cut off from everything else. How many Goliaths are here? Oh, one. <laughs> look at this. This is huge moves right now by Fantasy. Fantasy, I think, just takes another mineral-only expansion. Yeah, if that's what I can do, then that's what I'll do. Any expansion I can take, I'll try to take. This is what you're looking for now as Fantasy. You're no longer looking for large plays in the middle to secure wide spaces. You're looking for any weak point for Flash. You're, you're trying to find any caught-out group of tanks. Look at these wraiths, man. Look at these value wraiths. Isn't this sick? This is, I would call, a very clear advantage for Flash in that mid-game period. And now Fantasy's slowly chipping his way back. Fantasy saw that weak group there. Yeah, he lost quite a lot of tanks, but he's going to secure himself an expansion. Big relief. 
Still LCDs moving down to this side. These siege tanks from Flash tried to pick it off. A lot of action, a lot of action. Boom. Woo! Healthy, nice base with a terrible command center placement. What about this area? Yep, Fantasy's gonna try to poke into that too. Finding anything that he can and just going for it. Because all of Flash's units are super cut off. And this is really common when I watch Flash play Terran vs. Terran. And he wins a lot of games from this position where he just sets everything up defensively so just right. Like, look at this. Just a few tanks over here. Just these four. Gonna build a command center up on this side. Fancy's still trying to just pound any weak point that he can. Can we just take a moment to recall that right at the start of the show, I was emphasizing how this matchup becomes like whole map all the time. This is why. This is why all these things need to be thought of right from the get-go. Not because, you know, I'm trying to be all hoity-toity with my analysis. Like, oh, one must always think about the 45-minute mark when playing StarCraft. Like, no, this, this these games always go on long. Like, we're at 26 minutes into the game. And so Flash had ferried some of the units from here over to here. And again, fantasy. With the scans, just looking for weak points. And you'll also notice there's sort of a... Um, sort of a... a he's, he's cheating to the right. He's always trying to find weakness on this side of the map. He's not as much looking over here, because there's nothing of value here, right? There's just bases with no money left. This is really high value. This top right is really high value. So just with a few scans, he goes, Oh, look at that. You're weak here. Thanks to those rates providing that unbelievable vision, you can actually just march up and do stuff like this. I'm going to pause and ask, where are those wraiths? Where are those wraiths now? Wraiths, 20 years later, where are they? They may have died at some point. There's so much action in this game. Ah, here they are. Peacefully guarding. This expansion from drops. And I think this was just gorgeous, slow, gradual play from Fantasy. To be able to work all the way up to here. And now Flash is really not looking good. Fantasy has actually built lines of turrets in between where the dropships would go. So if you're Flash, you suddenly have all your factories over here. And no way for the units to get to this top right over here. Fantasy looks like he's finally going to be able to break into these extremely valuable expansions. They still have quite a lot of minerals. They still have geysers that are over half full. This one's almost out. And this is where desperation kicks in. I will not say that this reeks of desperation per se. But this is not the best move that you'd be desperate to do. You don't really want to drop tanks into this main base if everything's empty. But the Wraiths, the MVP Wraiths, just gonna isolate and pick off all these dropships. And it's easy to look at that and go, oh, Flash made a huge error. Well, Flash was in really bad shape. Flash is gonna lose these bases. It's only a matter of time now. And Fantasy somehow had the star sense to just have everything in position already. These turrets on the left side enormous. These are huge winners. These are MVP turrets. If you're playing Terran vs. Terran and you just jam some turrets on the side, hell yeah, man. Using defensive matrix on the forward tanks. Just marching everything right on up. Look at these. The wraiths still so smartly zoning. I think it's a zero dropship game from Fantasy. So insane to me. Constant scans coming out from Fantasy. I mean, look at this. This is that has quite a bit of energy. This is out. This is out of energy. This is just over one scan, just over one scan. A stunningly impressive game out of Fantasy. I'm actually still amazed that Flash like just has this base and it's just like still building tanks. What a marvelous TVT. He's actually losing this base. Now, Flash, again, 
move down with dropships through this narrow corridor, trying to find any window over here. Due to some very smart rallying, there's already some tanks nearby. These are the, the frontline tanks that Fantasy had kept there earlier. Fantasy's not giving up. He's going to keep pushing in. This is a really tough thing to do most of the time, just walk up. But look at how easy it was. He just walked in there because there's just nothing left. There's no way for anything to even get over there. Flash had to suicide several medevacs in there to be able to pull that off. And now this top right expansion is falling. Yet another hopeful doom drop from Flash, just trying to do anything. But this is not, this is not ideal. There's just not a lot of weak points for fantasy. And the crazy thing to me about fantasy is that he, he basically only has this one base over here and this one base over here, but he's just doing such smart things with his rates. Look, it's 123 supply to 116. And actually, in the grand scheme of things, Flash still probably has like a tiny edge in terms of overall army size. 3-3 three, three versus 3-2. Three, And the thing that's so key about this moment right now is that the only mining base for Flash is this one. And Flash will effectively never be able to take this base. It's very easy for these tanks here to just stay sieged forever. And now Fantasy can actually take these two top right bases. And Flash just has no minerals. Fantasy as though he wasn't badass enough is breaking through this side too and flash says gg and leaves oh and it deletes all his units from the minimap somehow come on show me what i want to see did i say medevac i don't care man i don't care medevacs dropships potato potato and I think that this game really highlights a couple things. One, just that I love about Brood War, is how dynamic that match was. There was a lot of back and forth and weird takings of unusual uh, expansions. There was weird takings of um, positions and defending and pushing them back and forth. And I would say Flash had a pretty clear advantage. And then Fantasy was able to use great skill in order to pull things back to his side. Just amazing Wraith usage. Uh, I also think it really highlights those key things that I talked about at the start. The idea of pl planning your positions long term and then trying to break through weak points later on. Let's look at the second game that they played in that series. Fantasy leads 1-0. So let's go to game 2. Where are they? Replays. Under the big ones folder. Hell yeah. So this map is... Neoelectric Circuit. Oh, it literally says it over there to the side. Nice! I never have to remember anything again. This is a map that if you watched the ZVT analysis uh, that happened last week, you'll recognize it. You have a main base that has a relatively wide entrance with an expansion, and then about a similarly sized entrance to that. So overall pretty safe, but you'll have to do some sort of early walling. There's also this unusual ramp to a mineral-only base that's very safe behind but it has this weird little backdoor plateau, and if you destroy these neutral buildings, you gain access to it. So these are, these are destructible rocks. There's also lots of compact expansions on the sides of this map. There's one right in between the two mains. So here's the next main base. Notice main, natural, mineral only base. And then again, same formation. Small gas focused expansion here. Triple base down here. The middle of the map is hardly a middle of the map. It's a very tiny amount of space that's broken up a little bit here. But not a lot of battles even need to happen here. There's this weird ring that you can see in this checkered pattern all around the outside. And so, very much of this game is trying to think about what's positioned where. If I have tanks here, and I have tanks here, this is maybe a good place for vultures to slip in. Would this be a good place for tanks to sneak in? Uh, it'd be a little risky. You'd probably have to go and guarantee that you'd only be able to siege up here, and does that accomplish anything? 
maybe access to this base, maybe. If I have some stuff sieged up, say, all along this side in the middle, that feels pretty good for securing some ground paths. This is safe, this is safe, this is safe. But I'm pretty far away from all of my expansions that are at the back. So I might be vulnerable to drops. It's a very tricky and technical map to manage everything on in Terran vs. Terran. Oh, and it doesn't help that everything's on low ground. So you can't see what's up here, you can't see what's up here, you can't see what's up here, you can't see what's up here. Very hard to get vision on this map. I think that's, at least in my opinion, what makes it very difficult and stressful. It's kind of funny to describe a mirror matchup as difficult on one map and less difficult on another, but I certainly feel that way in Zerg vs. Zerg, Terran vs. Terran, even though I'm not a Terran vs. player. So, Fantasy is in the top right this time, Flash is in the bottom right. And, as usual, Flash, ever the lover of Command Center first in this matchup. There was a period of time where, in the Pro League, Flash was one of these players on his team that would always win a game for his team. Um, the way the Pro League worked is it was basically just five 1v1s. Uh, and you would submit your lineup for games one through four before uh, the event. And then, like, a few days before, they would announce who the game one players were, the game two, the game three, and game four, so then you could see who you were against. And in that fifth match, if the teams were tied two and two, they would decide on the spot who they were sending out. And so Flash was this player who'd very often get two wins for his team every single time. He would just win his designated match, and they'd always put Flash out in the ace match, and he'd invariably win. So Terran players started to always build two barracks in the middle of the map against him and just rush him with Marines because almost always he would go command center first. And I think he had a running record of 0 and 10 in Terran versus Terrans with all 10 games being command center first, losing to double barracks in the middle. Because in his eyes, he was like, well, eventually they'll, they'll have to stop doing it, right? That can't happen every game. And no, no, it happened every single game. And he lost a whole bunch of times until he stopped doing it. Both players, though, doing conceptually the same build. Take an expansion as fast as you can. And here's this lovely little marine harassment that our good friend Fantasy loves to do. And occasionally he'll actually get something out of it. At the very least, he's getting lots of mining time out of Flash. But both players will proceed normally. Factory coming up. Boom. Let's try to take some of the lessons that we learned in that last game about positioning and try to stop and ask ourselves in the game, where, where are the weak points? Where do we want to go to? Where do we want to try to exploit? At which point in time? Quick double factory. Lots of SCVs mining in both places. More marine obnoxious pressure coming out of fantasy. Pretty cool to see. The scout barracks. Even a vulture to maybe help apply a little bit more pressure. As much as I love talking about interesting early harassment and attacking and all that stuff, it's still so important to just be like, dude, look, these guys are just going for tanks, okay? They're just getting their mech stuff up. He built a vulture, why? Because maybe he can break in the front and deal a little bit more damage. It doesn't work. But that's okay, because he's just he's just gonna be going tanks, okay? <laughs> like, that's it, that's it. At this point, I would put the advantage to Flash. He's just been a little bit more efficient in every single engagement. He's gotten all his buildings up a little bit faster. He's getting a Wraith up. Wraiths and tanks are really nice. We talked about how vision is a problem. It's hard to see up and down all these cliffs. Get a Wraith. Solves all your problems for you. It doesn't matter that that gets revealed. It doesn't matter at all. Control tower to allow dropship production to begin. And late siege tank upgrade is pretty common. You don't really need super fast siege mode. You can just walk your tanks forward and make him siege and then just keep backing up until your siege mode is done. And because Flash built so many tanks at the start of the game, he gets to do this sort of thing. We saw this move before. What did Flash do when he did this little cute move out? Yup, he expanded behind it. We see Fantasy again with the same kind of style. 
not going to be going for lots and lots of uh, vultures at this point in the game. Just going to go two and two. Get some goliaths right at the start. Make sure you can repel the wraiths. Yeah. Now this is this is a real scary spot to be in for both players. Why is it scary for fantasy? Well, if for whatever reason this dropship walks by, these tanks get by, then all of a sudden, Flash can use this high ground plateau to siege up with high ground advantage, things shooting from low ground to high ground, miss 50% of the time. If that happens, Flash gets this, then Fantasy is just on the slow road out. But this is also an uncomfortable position if you are Flash because your opponent can cut your reinforcement path in half. There's nothing back home. Nothing at all. So if we say, oh my gosh, what happens? Things slowly become bad news bears for Mr. Fantasy. Very nice tactic. The nicest thing about this tactic from Flash, he's expanded behind. He doesn't even actually have that many factories. He's just now getting factories three and four. And so what does Fantasy do here? Well, for one, he tries to set up reasonable defenses as fast as he can. But then he just counters. Then he just moves out to the other side. There's no way Flash can both be attacking here and be defending the front of his base so easily all at the same time. Fantasy says, you know what, this is a great idea. I'm actually just going to move over here. Mine's up the front. And you know what happens to Flash? Flash realizes he's not going to make any progress in, and he just loads up his tanks and retreats. <laughs> There's two things to note right now. One is that Flash's move up at this top side, any move you make in StarCraft, it doesn't need to win you the game. A lot of moves began as ways to just instantly win. A Reaver drop. If I drop a Reaver in your worker line, I blow up all your workers, and I instantly win. And that's very satisfying. But you don't have to deal that much damage. You can kill off some SCVs, like five, and that's pretty damn good. Just keep the Reaver and the shuttle alive, and you're in good shape. You forced them to make turrets. Nice. And Flash, I think, is masterful at this. This is wonderful to watch. He does this move that could end the game but commits nothing more here, just tries to guarantee that he gets some kills out of these siege tanks, and then he's gonna retreat. Uh, just a real common mistake that, hell, even I make it a lot, especially when I'm off racing, when I'm playing a non-Zerg race. Um, I'll just commit to this until everything's dead, <laughs> which is the StarCraft equivalent of push lanes until you die, right? I'll just keep attacking. And remember, the similar tenor to last game. Flash did an early move and got an early mineral-only expansion. Fantasy does a later move and gets a later gas expansion. The destructible rocks are now down. And ooh, that's so dirty. Uh-oh, careful, Flash, careful. That was really bad. These are the tanks that used to be involved in the great siege of the weird plateau. Get them. Nice. So at this point, relatively similar looking game. Flash is building out of two factories with nothing but tanks. Out of the rest of the factories, nothing but vultures making sure that he can get a big swell of vultures to take advantage of this unusual excess of minerals that he has in this matchup at this point. Same tactic that I was just talking about on the Fantasy Flash side up top, happening right here on Flash's base. In Fantasy's base, he is two building Vulture Tank, but he's also going into this weird Wraith move. Um, the only reason this is great right now is because it provides excellent vision up onto the high ground. If you're fantasy, you have to endlessly scan. 
this 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 is easy to lose. This is easy to just have Flash walk up here, even siege right here, and shoot over the ledge. So, Wraiths for Vision. This is part of what fascinates me about this matchup. You have players building units that, in most ways, are bad, but in the few ways in which they're good, they're essential. Like Vultures, they're just not good against anything, but they're the best way to spend the extra minerals you have. Yeah. What about these tanks? They're amazing against everything. What about these wraiths? Well, they die so easily, but they're great at giving vision to the tanks. And this is something that I think is a hallmark of Fantasy's moves in this uh, matchup. He is doing a very straightforward push. It's very sturdy. I'm not trying to hemorrhage too many units here or there. Flash, of course, is trying to peel to the left. Alleviates lots of pressure up at this side. And takes himself a base. So let's try to ask ourselves the following question. Oop, gotta rebuild the barracks. God, rates are so great. So great! Die. What is the big play for each of these players now? Let's actually pause since we're about 12 minutes into the game. Actually, let's go to 12 minutes. Actually, no, because Flash is beginning to make move outs. Yes. What would be your move? Command Center is going down. Yep, Command Center just to take advantage of this mineral only base. No reason not to. What are you worried about? What do you want to do? If I am Fantasy. I really like having this expansion. I want to put tanks here, because not only does it defend, but it also defends this pressure and allows me to swing over and attack here. This is one of the most important things for fantasy. What else is fantasy really worried about? Well, pretty much too many expansions down on this backside. Fantasy did the exact same thing last game. If we draw an, a, a line across the middle of the minimap, Fantasy has control past his side of the map. You can even do it like sort of diagonally like this. He has past center line control with lots of sturdy units, which is great. So the only thing that you really need to worry about as Fantasy is just making sure that Flash doesn't spiral out of control with bases down here in this bottom side. If you're Flash, what do you need to worry about? Well, you kind of need to worry about this backside here, this backside here, and the fact that your opponent already has a big chunk out of the center and a functioning gas base. So you want to find some way to attack this or break through here. So this is the big thing that I'd be looking for if I were Flash, is how on earth do I just break in here and try to seize some additional control? There we go. This is going to be really tough for Fantasy to ever convince himself to move. So great. Very similar to last game, Fantasy. Moves forward, takes a third with gas, moves back. And I really love the way that we're going to see Fantasy utilize these tanks all game long. These vultures walked into the front entrance. Like, no problem ran right into them. Even a single tank up here. <laughs> Raging Octopod says, How TV2 is ever spectated without zoom is beyond me. It's actually pretty easy to follow with, zo with zoom. You can just sort of look at the minimap a lot. But zoom is way better, so we're just going to go ahead and zoom out. Yeah. So Flash doing these little counter attackies. Trying to continue this same set of maneuvers that he did in the last game. He's very tank strong with an excess of vultures maneuvers. And where is he attacking? He's attacking the point. You'll see this is a line. Here's the line of tanks. It ends here. So he goes up to the point. So he just picks it off. Often you'll see if you even can pick off the point first. And then once you do, 
you can begin to make moves like, oh, this expansion looks safe, this expansion looks safe. Now Flash is doing uh, a few things at the same time, but we can pause it to just go, oh, yeah, no, he's just sending vultures here to clear out this area so that he can just expand. Yeah, seems, seems, seems straightforward. Great. And once again, if I am fantasy, I'm going to start to feel a little bit of pain here. Slash is doing a really nice job of breaking through and getting edges. This was a little bit more neutral of an exchange. With maybe fantasy coming out marginally better in this. But Flash has still kind of made his goal clear. Just keep chewing away at this tank line that's in the middle. But gosh, you can't both be double expanding and breaking into the top side of the tank line and breaking through the mid side of the tank line and defending here with all your tanks and be defending everywhere at once. You just can't be doing that. And so, whereas Flash is much more about trying to hit so many places at once with pretty significant forces that he forces you on the back foot and then he gets to expand a lot, Fantasy just kind of does this one thing. He's just been defending and then he's like, all right, you're too far forward. Taking advantage of that. This is like my favorite matchup to watch big long matches of. It's just it's just so interesting to see these shapes reposition and change and break and reform and rejoin and then break. Lots of tank vultures still. Lots of trying to pick away still. This is kind of cute. Because vultures are so big in this matchup just for picking off small numbers of key units, players will get extra Valkyries to make sure that their wraiths quickly shoot down the enemy's wraiths with the Valkyrie support. Same old, same old story. A few vultures trying to do some sneaky stuff, but... Really, it's fantasy in the defensive mode. Flash in the more aggressive mode. And you, I mean, you can just kind of see it if you look at their respective visions. Like, Flash is pushed out and is very far away from his home. I mean, like, the closest path to his home is actually controlled. This is, like, very far forward. You look at fantasy's vision, fantasy is the exact opposite. He's very much so all together. All his bases are right here, and he has his forces outside the front of one and outside one side of the other. And he's doing little attacks on this side, but they're not with tanks. They're just with vultures. A little fast, harassy guys. So what would be your move? Well, it's too bad I asked the question, because we just see Fantasy doing a very natural response. This is, this is one of the few times we actually see a very natural answer from Fantasy, where he's just like, you know what? You pushed in on this side. I'm going to push right back out on this side. If I'm Flash, though, I like these moves that I'm doing up here, but really, I'm all about these bottom left bases. This is, this is really nice that Fantasy is being annoying here. Fantasy is expanding to the safest things that he can. This also explains a little bit why he's jutting out here, he wants to expand up here, keeping it straightforward. Now, if you're Fantasy, I'd like to note you already have this side base. And if all things are equal and you deny Flash this base, if you literally go to like 7 base versus 8 base and you're the 8 base, that's one way to win. And a relatively common way to win at that. So this exchange was pretty massive. This is like almost every single tank of fantasy moving forward. And it was not good. It got pretty mauled on the top side. I mean, this was this was quite a blow there for Fantasy. Fantasy, I think, underestimated how many tanks were here and how many vultures were coming from this side. Still getting shut down on this left. And once again, Fantasy is behind in the mid game. I would just put Flash in a very solid advantage at this point in time. Has his wraiths back in the main base. I mean, he is going just ground heavy. That's it. No extra... No extra starports, no wraiths, no dropships, none of that. It's crazy to see a dropshipless Terran. 
So Fantasy's now going, you know what? I'm actually going to take a lesson out of Flash's book. I am going to just... I haven't been attacked here. Uh, I didn't do so well here. Let me actually just run some stronger units all the way around this left side and try to shut this down. Which I think is an okay maneuver. Flash then tries to break through this side. And I, I would describe this as barely defending it as fantasy. That was just a very miraculous, like, holy cow, I can't believe you lived through that moment. Dude, I'm telling you, the line of tanks, man, that is this matchup. That is what this matchup is about. Single siege tank trying to be annoying. And hey, look at this little vulture path. Yeah. I really don't even feel like Fantasy has done that much attacking this entire game. This has felt like Flash doing most of the attacking. Oh god, I'm so glad I take notes before I do this. Now in the meantime, while Flash has been building up this army of vultures and tanks, doing crazy things here, trying to get this double expansion finally up and secured, even though it technically isn't secured until the Vespian Geyser's up. Remember the big goals we talked about early on? Well... 7 base versus 8 base. Flash is just going to wait until he sees a small window of opportunity. And he's just going to inch his way in there and siege up. And effectively take this base. Now, if you asked me who's winning right now, I would just... I'd just be like, Flash! I would just, <laughs> as fast as I could say it, I'd say Flash. Flash has plus 2 tanks. That means his siege tanks kill enemy siege tanks in 2 hits. Fantasy has plus 2, but... Technically, you know, the plating is good, but it doesn't really do that much. But right now, Fantasy is just now getting established on this base. Hasn't really gotten this established yet. So it's going to be really one, or excuse me, one gas here. And this other gas is gone. Flash has expansions to match on the top and bottom. But Flash also has these bases here. Flash has established a de defense over here from the push that Fantasy's trying to do. Fantasy's shut, or Flash has shut this down. What is our red player Fantasy to do? I was just again like, oh no, that's it. Yeah, this is this is advantage to Flash. So this game is never really over like ever it's just it's never over it just takes so much to actually break through location after location cost efficiently and i think we can actually go to the fantasy cam to see this huge play because really the fantasy cam that we're interested in for the rest of this game man if you're holding off all these things he's lost stuff over here he hasn't been able to break in here he doesn't even have full control over the center yeah these two are gone that's good what to do literally every single unit that fantasy has anywhere on the entire map he unsieges and brings here and he just scans the main base and goes oh wait a minute that's right you can't both be dropping and defending this, and defending this, and double expanding. You can't be doing all of that at the same time. This was one of the most kamikaze, cross your fingers and pray moments. I mean, look, like Flash is still doing like vulture drops up this top side. Just found one huge weakness. Now, you heard me talk about this in the last game, about how these sorts of Hail Marys are not really what you want to do. You kind of want to be denying bases. But, dude, it's undeniable. If you can break in and kill off someone's production and lock them in that way, this is the same story as last game. It just has a lightly different look. All of Flash's production is here. There's some units for Flash here. There's some units for Flash here. And this is totally undefended. This is basically totally undefended. 
And Fantasy kind of knows this now. I'm actually going to go back to the Fantasy can. Fantasy just starts scanning around. Where's anything that my opponent's doing? He starts doing the, the Wraith move, where he begins to produce Wraiths in large numbers to control the space on the map. This Wraith transition is so good. It just defends against these tiny drops so well. All these forces here, they stay there. Suddenly, there's no need to defend the middle. Everything is contained in the main base, unless it has drop ships. And then, thanks to going Wraiths, He can control those super easily. And look at this, he commits everything until he sees there's no defenses, and then he retreats the tanks and leaves the vultures. Flash now, in desperation mode. Has a small fledgling group of units over here doing stuff. Has like five tanks here, a base. These are in shambles, these aren't doing anything anymore. And in one huge move, Fantasy just guts Flash. I, that's just incredible timing. Incredible follow-up. Still just everything outside the front. Look, some weird rallies are being forgotten. These wraiths, not really good against anything, but damn, they're good against completely undefended tanks, huh? Numbers are going up, suddenly Flash is like, Ugh, I'm not going to have any more tanks to defend this expansion. Yeah, I mean, Flash got this. Fantasy has to lift this off. Again, we're in the slightly weird low econ situation. But, I mean, Fantasy's just... crushed Flash. Has everything completely surrounded. And Flash has his trademark island of units, not necessarily really doing anything. Manages to make this work in TVT a surprisingly high percentage of the time. So right now, if you are Flash, you're like, well, wait a minute. Well, maybe maybe I don't have anything mi mining, but maybe you also don't have anything mining. Fancy's like, all right, I'm going to take this weird, stupid base. <laughs> I'm eventually going to retake this one, too. All fa Fantasy's doing is just surrounding this base. Leaves a small number of things. Pulls mostly everything back. Dude, so sick. He just keeps scanning on the dropships. And there's never any chance for Flash to get out. Scrappy, huh? Very cute from Flash to try to take this expansion. An interesting maneuver until he gets spotted at all by Fantasy. But he won the game three or four minutes ago. Ah, <sighs> oh, that was so good! And I think that um, it's really hard to find those ways to win unless you go into the game knowing that you need to look for it. Hold on while I drink my water. It's very easy to... Um, in many of the... Gosh, it's hard to think of one where it isn't true, but there, there's a lot of RTS games that have a um, compositional focus in them. You know, like uh, Age of Empires, Age of Mythology, StarCraft II, things like Light and Armored, where you're trying to build the thing to counter the thing that he's making, this sort of thing. So very often um, in... Let, let me pick a game at random here. In something like StarCraft II, it's very common to look at a match and to say, okay, well, my opponent is doing X when I have four Colossi. That's when it's time to go and do the big attack. 
and you have all your units in a ball and you're trying to figure out the right units to put in that ball to go swoosh in and end the game. And you might do a harassment move, but then you come back and say, hi, I've harassed. And now I can go with three colossi or things like this. It's certainly a bit of an oversimplification, but the idea is I'm trying to highlight that mindset of figuring out the right unit to build and the moment to attack. Because if you watch a lot of pros or try to mimic them, they'll have consistent timings in StarCraft II. Terran vs. Terran is one of the best representations of how Brood War does not really operate in that way. Not nearly as strongly, at least. When you go into that game, it is much more about giving yourself opportunities. You have vultures and tanks. Okay, it's an opportunity to do something, but then you have to look around and see where those exist. And you don't take everything. You take some of your stuff. And how much do you leave behind? Well, you have to make the judgment call in there. And I think that, that is just an incredible, marvelous example in those first two Flash vs. Fantasy games, which brings us now to game three of their series, which is a little bit different of a game. Um, I cannot remember the name of this map at all. Uh, this is the one that has the... Well, it has, it has a shape in the middle. <laughs> so, um, main base. A little bit more accessible by air because it is just a, such a large main base by volume. Uh, Sniper's Ridge, thank you, Avex, for the reminder. You have the uh, natural expansion here. Relatively wide entrance. And there's really just one extra expansion that you get here. It's right outside your front. It has this weird entrance here. But it's a third gas. Very different from the last map that had easy access to a mineral-only expansion. This has easy access to a gas expansion uh, that actually doesn't have that many, many minerals. That is just six. In terms of the uh, the shapes that we see here, this is a low ground, and then a high ground, and then a low ground. And similarly, this is a ramp, high ground, ramp to low ground. So excuse me, th these are ramps on these sides. Uh, so you, you have a little bit of a block of vision here. You can imagine how nice it is to get a line of tanks sieged here in this matchup, because if I walk forward, you just siege up here, boom, you're done. Outside of that, uh, there's this odd center expansion, which is very relevant in this matchup, because if we're doing half-map splits, you get six base, I get six base, well, who the hell's gonna get the middle base? Probably the winner. So other than that, it's just the same pattern repeated. Main, natural, third base. Same thing up here. Main, natural, third base. Does this thing have one less mineral patch? Did I count that correctly? Oh, no, I was just zoomed out, so these two looked like one mineral patch. So for the purposes of Terran vs. Terran, there's not really a good open center. There's these high ground ridges. There's these ridges. There's this weird circular thing that technically has entrance and exit points at these locations. And let's ask ourselves the question, how would this change our opening? Well, we might want to get our tanks into uh, better positions early. We might value that a little more. Uh, having vision is very, very important to us. Again, we see Fantasy stick into his guns, just going for barracks into expansion. We see also Flash sticking to his guns. No, no, he's not. He's going for a barracks before his command center. <gasps> Micro Wars. Going for the refinery. Oh, factories for both. Right, seems pretty good. Both of them going for relatively early expansions. Nothing. Out of the ordinary. But this is where we start to see divergence between the two. Flash being slightly more conservative, making sure that he can get a wall off, at least a partial wall off, to be anti-vulture. See Fantasy doing his thing of getting his early barracks float and sending marines out in order to be active and do stuff. And haha, -ha, here is a departure. We see a starport from Fantasy and a starport. Double starport. 
Big main, very easy to scout, very easy to see everything. There's your starports. And oh my, double starport from Flash as well. Let's take a moment to just think about what is a double starport going to do in this matchup. We already know that Wraiths really, really struggle against any number of Goliaths and any number of turrets. Unless those numbers are like two Goliaths. If it's like two Goliaths, and I have six Wraiths, I can pick off those Goliaths. Also, if I'm able to get enough Wraiths, I can begin to one-shot SCVs, or at the very least, two-shot them. I believe, is it five? Is five the critical number? I can't remember what the critical number is. I think, I think it's five Wraiths take two volleys to kill uh, an SCV. I think, God, that's gonna bug me for the rest of the day. By the way, this is, this is how the actual computations work in this game. Lots of other games are about like DPS, you know, like how do I maximize the total damage output if I right click and then walk away? Uh, in StarCraft, it's about, it's about hits. Uh, so uh, you try to figure out how to reduce number of hits or make that, yeah, it's just reduce number of hits is basically, I'm repeating myself right now. So for instance, Mutalisks, deal 9 damage, so if you have 11 Mutalisks in a control group, they'll deal 99 damage to a turret, which is not enough, but if you get plus 1 attack, that will mean that you can kill a turret in 2 volleys instead of 3 volleys. Is it 4 Wraiths, 2 volleys? I feel like there's something critical I'm forgetting about this, but Wraiths do 8 damage, SCVs have 60 health, so it looks like it's 4. Looks like it's four. Okay. So why might we be actually getting Wraiths in this matchup? Well, there's this thing where you have to be getting some sort of anti-cloak. You have to be getting an academy. And if you can burn out your opponent on scans, you can just get massive damage dealt with SCVs. Or two SCVs. If your opponent doesn't build enough Goliaths, you can get massive damage dealt to SCVs. But Let's answer this question, why go to Port Wraith, as it relates to tanks and the mid game. Why is this good? Well, if I have a lot of Wraiths, I can force you to retreat or pull your tanks back. Otherwise, I'll pick them off with my Wraiths and my tanks, because I can see farther than your tanks. So this opening has Overall, a weaker ground force, because you just are simply not getting as many tanks as quickly. But you can do so much more with those tanks. In particular, imagine if you could go to Port Wraith, and if you could siege some tanks up here, and maybe even move one up over to this little high ground area, with maybe two over here, and you can start chipping away at these. Ooh, this little high ground area is actually seeming very tempting. Hard to get there. But very helpful if you have wraiths. So here's where fantasy gets in. He gets to see some suspicious things. There's just one factory, okay. The problem is if both of you are going to port wraiths, this becomes one of the most volatile opening situations in all of TVT. Wraiths deal a ton of damage to Wraiths. They deal 20 damage, and that's full. Wraiths have no armor, so it takes six shots from a Wraith to kill a Wraith. Compare that to the Burst Laser that deals eight damage and shoots more slowly. It will take eight shots to kill an SCV. So, yeah, Wraiths are really good against Wraiths. If we've seen the last two games, we know that this is what Flash has been doing virtually every game, opening with just one Wraith. And you know what Flash is doing with the other Wraith? He's just kind of concealing it. He's not revealing that he has all these Wraiths just churning out. And in the meantime... 
fantasy is hiding his own wraiths. What he wants to do is he wants to get to that critical number to be able to absolutely annihilate Flash's wraiths. We see Cloak for both of them. And this... This is the game-losing move for Flash. Fantasy waits until his cloaking research is done. Goes in. Shoots and pre-scans. Look at that. Instantly, Flash loses three critical wraiths. Instantly. Completely blindsided. Sees the ripple. Scans. Misclicks. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you. Even amazing players like Fantasy who just see the ripple of a wraith and immediately scan will still mess up stuff. Like, sometimes they'll just forget to right-click. And look at this. With absolutely no anti-air other than those wraiths. Does he even have siege mode done? No, he doesn't even have siege mode done. Fantasy was not in his build order expecting to be able to do so much damage at this point. He's just target firing the tanks, not target firing the SCVs. Look at the juicy sieges. This is the semi-final that shocked so many people. Fantasy 3-0-ing Flash. 3 and 0. In two games where he was actually behind, and really just found the one weak point that Flash had, and hit him there. I love this Fantasy literally just hiding his wraiths. Yeah, he's taking damage on the tanks, but no big deal. He just needs to make sure that he keeps his wraith count high. GG. Oh. And there you have it. I'm really glad about the ordering that happened in that game. The fact that it was a drawn-out game one, a drawn-out game two, and a quick game three. To even be able to appreciate what happened in Game 3, you have to see the direction that Terran vs. Terrans tend to go in, which is this large map, dynamic positions, trying to find weakness, res uh, resorting to the sturdier units of tanks and goliaths as being core, sometimes flooding vultures in order to do more things with gaining position, and so on and so forth. And then that third game was going, ah, what about an interesting detour? We're still going to head to the same mid-game, but maybe we can do some early tactics. And it's when multiple players are doing this sort of tactical, cutesy uh, opening, when things can become very unstable. Other matchups, you'll see things like someone going for a proxy Reaver drop and another person going for proxy Dark Templar. And the games can be really stupid and fragile because the Dark Templar gets spotted, the guy who's going proxy Reaver just builds an Observer, and then Reaver drops and immediately wins the game. <laughs> like so... <laughs> um, yeah, I just think it's a fantastic series And even though Flash got knocked out And Fantasy would later go on to get second place in that Star League Losing to Um Flash still goes down as the strongest Terran player in history With Fantasy, I would say just being right behind him I really think Flash and Fantasy are the two big Terran names in the modern Brood War era well, I should say, in that modern Brood War era. Nowadays, it's Flash and Last. Ooh, you should know the name Last, as well as Sharp. Sharp is good. Uh, excellent. Well, on Thursday, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at our first matchup-specific video. Whoa! We've done analyses in the past, but that's a lot more of let's look at a high-level game, talk about its history, its significance, and why it's cool. On Thursday, we're actually going to say, why is Terran vs. Protoss the way it is at all? What are common Terran openings? What are common Protoss openings? And that won't cover all the dimensions of the matchup by any means. We still want to talk about cheeses. We still want to talk about more advanced strategies, some more unorthodox strategies. We'll still want to look at longer games and talk about how it relates to the topics at hand. But we're going to be starting with Terran vs. Protoss on Thursday at 5 p.m. I look forward to seeing you there.
Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic evening.